healing. Ask Mrs. Harachi to come to me. It was acquired from the former Prince of Danzig, 1967. <laughs> Lambert knows the exact hour and date each piece was purchased. He's got the carrots, cuts, and settings on a master list. makes my feet tingle and my nose red and I could get drunk on it, Alex, I know it. And what, my dear, is that? The air. Clean, clear, crisp. It's one of my favorite memories. Christmas in the Alps and the north wind, just like this, never letting you forget you're alive. See you later, darling. Downstairs? After a while. Hello, Noel. Mr. Lovell. All alone. And very tired, Mr. Hadrachi. Uh, this uh, won't take but a moment. Richard, isn't it? Richard. One day you will be married, and you may have a daughter. Like myself, you will take an exaggerated... In what happened? Someone tried to shoot him. His pills, get Lambert. Get Dr. Jameson. Tell Mrs. Adrachi. Someone help me get him to his room. Please. You should lie down. No. I'm quite all right, Irene, my dear. Sit. Sit with me. We should go home to Greece. With a killer on board? No. Go back to Tokyo or Vancouver. It's closer. They have police. We don't need squads of provincial Canadian detectives. Lambert has three men can guard this room night and day. Of course, Alex, you could spend the rest of your life behind a shield of former FBI agents, guarded by police dogs. But is that living? Whoever wants your life is on board this ship. The spur is hot. Seize the moment. Now there's a thought. This whole barge full of Western decadence. Its veil of mystery penetrated by an inscrutable mind from the East. Oh, that would be delicious. A detective. Incorruptible, infallible. Ah, oh, unfortunately retired. I buy only the best. Don't retire him. Frankly, Alex. And this may surprise the fifth richest man in the world. But there are some men even you can't buy. Is that right? And who is this man? Charlie Chan.
My grandchildren have not yet washed for supper. Son Stephen has driven over unexpectedly from the other side of the island. A strange car is parked in front of the house, and the air is filled with the aroma of special delicacies. Deduction? We have an honored guest in our house. How do I know? It's a Randy car. Good. How do you know? By the license plate. He is a man, and he smokes a pipe. How do I know? There are arses on the front seat. And he is a medium height man. Perhaps so big. You saw him. No. I saw only the position of the front seat move forward to make room for a man with medium long legs. No. What else do we know about this man? Uh, he was very much interested in this case. We oh, yes, I remember that one. Mr. Oh, thanks, Oliver. I was telling him about this case, remember? Mm. I've almost went out for that. Grandpappy's home. Blow a fuse or something. Everybody, in, in, in. Oh, oh. Andrew. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Oh, oh, unexpected appearance of long absent friend, like finding five dollars in pocket of old suit. Uh, pleasant and most rewarding surprise. How are you, Andrew? Well, at the moment, I'm stunned by the fertility of this. Uh, Volcanic paradise. <laughs> Son Stephen has produced his own rock group. Doreen has surely blossomed since I was last here. <laughs> While Oliver and my Ling seem obsessed with engulfing you in a wave of grandchildren. As for you, Charlie, well, apparently you've found someplace on this island, the elusive fountain of youth. Oh. oh, when one has reached the age of 60, Andrew, it is only the wrinkles within which matter. Fortunately, I have been very well cradled in most happy family compound. Go in, sit, 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 sit. Ah, oh, thank you. Genghis. Genghis. <laughs> I'm sorry. I suppose uh, uh, the life of a businessman suits you. Oh, yes. We have over 500 acres of pineapple. Top grade. Ah, oh, yes. Bookkeeping, crating, shipping, fertilizer, mm -hmm. damp diapers. Oh, grandchildren are a joy. Like summer rain. Disconcerting, but uh, very necessary. Huh? <laughs> Those delightful homilies, Charlie. Those rustic rubrics of philosophy. It's good to see that they persevere. You know, I was afraid, when you persisted in refusing Mr. Hadrach's offer, that perhaps after ten years of retirement, you might have lost your touch. Oh, Andrew. You arrived nervously at 4.30. What? Breaking your pipe while knocking out ash on the heel of your shoe. Then you made long-distance telephone call to uh, British Columbia before Stephen arrived. Oh, you also brought two bottles of wine, a gift now resting on top shelf of the refrigerator. Uh, white wine, correct? The uh, scrapbooks have been examined and hastily replaced, I see. No doubt uh, satisfying self that annals of crime are more than of passing interest to me. Yes, 200 of the most interesting unsolved crimes of the past decade analyzed from the creaking confines of a bamboo rocking chair. I should think you'd be bursting, Charlie, to stalk a hot clue at the very scene of the crime. No, Andrew, no, no, no. Thank you. I am quite content in this house, very con... Am I not content? You are sometimes very restless, more and more, Papa Chan. Stephen? Last week, we closed a $200,000 deal while the rest of us were celebrating. You drank a glass of warm milk and went to bed. Twenty years ago, I remember you clearing some little gardener of a murder rap. You had his kids up and dancing all night. Unfortunately, this is no beleaguered little gardener. 
This is only King Agamemnon stalked by assassins in his floating throne room. But doesn't he deserve your help as much as anyone else? Grandpa, are you going to let that ruthless killer hatch his foul scheme without lifting a finger? How much did the gentleman give you, Tina? Fifty cents. You should have held out for a whole dollar. Hatch's children from his first marriage. Yes, their mother was uh, killed in a plane crash along with uh, 50 more impoverished souls. Hmm? Disaster is so democratic. And these then are the others who are aboard the ship? Yes, Dr. Jameson, Alex's private physician, and the Grombachs. He's a wine grower, German. Uh, Mr. Lambert is head of Hadrachi's security? Yes, he put that folder together for you. He'll be meeting us in Vancouver. And Mr. Giancarlo Tui is evidently an Italian playboy of sorts. Yes, very rich family from Milan. The next one is Noel Adamson. He used to be an actor, I believe. Has something to do with real estate today. And this is your secretary, Mr. Love. Yes, he sent me that when he applied six months ago. Hmm. And there are no other heirs? There was, almost. Ariane was as radiant as any Botticelli for five months. Miss Carriage. Oh, she was inconsolable. He accepted it with proper Greek stoicism. Oh, that was six years ago. Flight 12, non-stop jet service to Vancouver, British Columbia, is now boarding at gate 5. Yes, sir, that flight is already on board. Thank you. Non-stop jet service Excuse to me. Vancouver is now boarding at gate 5. International passengers proceeding to Canada may use facilities at the east end of the terminal. Thank you. Excuse me. Oh, thank you. What is it, Pop? According to this, my laundry is ready. Pop, please. Pop! Pop? See, Pop, it's me! Do you know him? Yes, slightly. I'm his son, Peter. Number eight. Who was supposed to be studying psychology in San Francisco. Who is also black belt judo champion. And father's personal bodyguard. I have no need... It's a family decision, and you're hopelessly outnumbered, Pop. <clears throat> All right. On one condition, no more Pop. 
Papas are sound. Papas for champagne, papas for balloons. Papas for music, papas for art, papas for soft drinks. Right. Gotcha, Pop. Hadrachi clan, the more I feel like a medieval minstrel, asked to be a house guest of the Borgias. Flight 12, the Colombian, from San Francisco, is now arriving at gate 3. Mr. Hadrachi will be waiting. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, Andrew, uh, uh, please, this most rudimentary organ of detection indicates proximity of... Uh, Superb seafood cuisine where two young Chinese tourists who are nervous may unwind. If you would. Of course. Don't worry, Pop. I'll take care of her. Uh, number eight, son, most kind but also most forgetful. Pop is for weasels. Pop is for corn. Thank you. We try not to keep Mr. Hadrachi waiting. What's wrong? Uh, nothing. Nothing. No. No, tell him that is final. By tomorrow. Yes. and wins by sheer obstinacy. He simply refuses to lose at anything. Senor Adamson. of a giant hound. Which obviously has consumed bullet intended for your husband. How tall was the assassin, Mr. Chan? Did he have a scar on his ring finger? Uh, what did he have for supper last night? Probably the same thing you did, Mrs. Hadrachi. 
and know if you will excuse me. Ah, Mr. Chan. I am so glad you are here. I, too. Most grateful to be alive. Yes, yes, that appalling incident at the airport. Yes. Paul suggests... Uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chan, my son Paul. He suggests, uh, perhaps an old enemy, out to settle a rankling score. Well, the face was not familiar to me. One can forget a lot of things in ten years of inactivity, Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan, won't you sit down? Thank you. Paul has expressed concern that this is to be your first private investigation. Honestly, Mr. Chan, will you make such a snap judgment about your attacker if you still had access to all of the fingerprint records, the laboratory tests, the official connections you once had as a member of the Honolulu Police Department? Mr. Hadrachi, I have exchanged the comforts of my beloved islands for jet age fatigue and a near brush with death. I have not come here to be auditioned. I never knew this man. I do not rule out the possibility he may have been a friend or relative of someone whom I once apprehended. Neither do I subscribe to this theory. I merely feel that since my comings and goings are no longer a matter of journalistic front page conjecture, it is a noteworthy coincidence that someone boards the plane at San Francisco and subsequently tries to kill me just when I am on my way to you. My father was shot at aboard this yacht hundreds of miles out at sea. What possible connection? This is an age of instant communication, not always reserved for innocent messages. My assailant was a professional, recently arrived from Hong Kong, probably sent for. In addition, he had been operated within the past five years for glaucoma. The surgery, while successful, was performed under relatively primitive circumstances. Beyond that, he was a master gunsmith. That is all I know about him right now. But then, I only had a quick glimpse of him at airport. Who he is, and by whom employed, I will, of course, find out. <laughs> My son, I'm afraid, tends to regard anyone past the mid-century mark as in his dotage. He is, of course, oblivious to the fact that you and I are contemporaries. Well, it is quite natural for him to be protective, particularly in view of the increase in your recent heart attacks, and all the more commendable when one considers who would be sitting on that side of the desk if anything should befall you. Mr. Chan, you were raised, no doubt, on Confucius, I and Homer. There is a passage from the Odyssey, difficult, as always, to translate, about those who are born to lead, who, mingling with the common crowd, find themselves lost in the affairs of ordinary men. I must confess to you, Mr. Chan, I may be lost like that, blind to the emotions of the characters common to our tragedies, whom are surrounding me, physician, wife, author, children, Palace guards, rivals, jesters. However, I can assure you, I have no wish to join the cast in the role of a murdered hero. Whatever you want, Mr. Chan, just to be my eyes and ears, I must understand what is happening around me. If the amount is insufficient, please just say so. I feel I must point out to you that the fruit of the lychee nut cannot be preserved without first removing the shell. There can be no secrets kept from me. Our privacy is sacred to us, Mr. Chan. Indeed, the ultimate in privacy is the tomb. Casanova? John Carlo. I never associate you Italians with Casanova. 
Surely one thinks of linguini in Italy, not lovers. Ah, Signora's being adorably contrary tonight. Beyond argument, Mr. Chan, you are the most fascinating man aboard this ship. Tall, dark, and inscrutable. <laughs> Sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night, terrified and trembling. Doesn't matter what I say or do, nothing seems to make any difference. During the war, I commandeered a whole warehouse full of it in rhymes. <laughs> and in Greece, Herr Grumbach, what did you commandeer? Well, Mr. Kidder is certainly very lucky. What exactly does one have to do to merit one's own confidential secretary? Dangle your participles, Mrs. Grumbach. Dangle your participles. Terms are interest prepaid at 9%. Just uh, settling this little land deal in Malta. Ta-da. Very good. <laughs> he has got a nibble from another group. I just as well sign, get him off my back. Mr. Grumbach, who is supposed to be a wine grower, is totally unfamiliar with the two greatest years of German ice wine. Moreover, the seal of the ring which he is wearing is that of a German engineering society, and his accent is not from the wine-growing country at all. It's more Bayerisch Deutsch from Baden-Baden. Well, following graduation in 1939 from the Institute at Leipzig, Mr. Grumbach, real name Henninger, spent six months revamping the cryogenics lab at Dortmund. Ah. His first marriage was in October 1940 to the former Frieda Schmidt, a laboratory assistant. Now, the current Mrs. Grumbach... Yes, I know. Former fashion model, Polish, I believe, from Savannah. Mr. Henniger and I are involved in highly confidential discussions regarding certain patents. It is imperative that his real identity not be revealed. We will respect that confidence, Mr. Chan. thinking about what you asked me yesterday, about my mother, what it used to be like. Uh, that's my dear. If we can educate these musicians... But, Father, what about your heart? My heart is great. He will understand. Dr. Jameson has had the exacting responsibility of keeping Alex alive for the past eight years. What keeps you going, killer? Bottle of bile every now and then? An occasional spleen transplant? Doctor? Uh, you mentioned Berkeley. You don't happen to know Professor Calvert, do you? Cecil Calvert? He's head of the neurology department. I room with his son. You remember, Pop. Afraid neurology is not my field. Hangovers, indigestions, and sunburn. That's what you specialize in on the jet set circuit. 
Seven years I've watched you freeload and listen to your scorn and so-called wit. And I've yet to find you amusing. The uh, cynical, accurate eye of the author is not always appreciated. Neither is your constant stirring up of trouble. We're not here to act out scenes for you and hand you dialogue for your rotten novels. Treat us with respect, kiddo. That will get out. Say one thing for judo. It almost gets in shape for a Greek dance. <laughs> Where is your nimble sister? No midnight rendezvous with the Grecian princess. Oh. Have you brought it all? All I could carry. If I were wearing any more, I couldn't stand. I've got a taxi waiting at the pier. We'll be at the airstrip in no time. Stay put, darling. I'll be right back. It's Mr. Lovell, sir. He's dead. No. And Mrs. Hadrachi's gone in the launch with Mr. Adamson. Shadow, etc., etc., etc. Andrew, please disturb nothing, please. It is imperative in these situations that victim and detective have a moment of absolute privacy. Please, please. Thank you. See Miss Hadrachi to her room. Uh, can you manage? Yes. Come, Alex. Please. Lean on me. Hey, Pop. Somebody slugged her. 
Are you all right? You can't keep a good Chen down. Find a bed for her. Have Dr. Jameson examine her immediately. Go, go. Mr. Lambert, huh? Lambert. I want this door locked. Thank you. Purpose of visit? What do you mean, purpose of visit? My name is Giancarlo Tui. T-U-I. Lucky, lucky Richard. Struck down in the prime of his anonymity. Yeah, yeah, I was in my room. Number 15, number 14. No smoking. We're not smoking. We're ridding this place of karma, evil karma. You say you chartered a plane to Seattle. There is no chartered plane to Seattle. You say you reserved the cab yesterday and the driver says he was waiting for somebody else. You say you talked Mrs. Hedrachi into running away with you, yet she denies it. You, a Scorpio, talk me a Leo into running away to Seattle? <laughs> It was the moon. Oh, Alex. Alex, you know how I am when the moon is full. We were just going to go up into the hills and hear the wolves howl. Watch the lights twinkling below. My son is ready to go to work. Kiss is the moth ready for the candle? Possibly. An unfortunate Possibly. metaphor. Nevertheless, I have reason to believe that Lovell was typing something other than the old manuscript left in his typewriter. Perhaps Adamson picked it up since it is not on his person. If it was evidence, he'd want to get rid of it and as far from the scene of the crime as possible, right? Very good. Miss Chan, is Adamson the man who hit you? I only saw his eyes. It's so hard to be sure. Was he the same height? I hardly knew Lovell. We've been on the yacht together for a month. The same might be said of Giancarlo, the Grumbachs. They didn't run off. I told you that was a coincidence. But you couldn't make a positive identification. Why did you really come here? To swing a deal, I swear it. Kidder put me on to it. Kidder? Yeah, we met in London. He steered me into contacting your father. Inspector McKenzie! You impound my ship. You charge my wife as an accessory. And now you want my passport. I could make one call to Ottawa, Inspector, and have you washing police cars, not driving them. Unfortunately, Mr. Hadraji, the phones are busy for the moment. Now, I can send a man for your passport if that is more convenient. In the meantime, your full name is Alexander Constantine Hadraji, and you are exactly where at 10 p.m.? The world's greatest detective. And what have I got to show for it? Lovell murdered, my wife slandered, and I, Mr. Cha, forced to suffer this plodding provincial investigation. This is no Labrintian maze, no Gordian knot, no Olympian challenge. It is a simple case, which I would have expected you to dispatch as handily as Hercules strangled the serpents in his cradle.
morning, Inspector. Good morning, Mr. Jan. Good morning. I, I wonder if your men might indulge me in a small whim and uh, dust the nozzle of the fire hose outside the door for fingerprints. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm terribly sorry I am late, but uh, I was delayed. I had several telephone calls which I had to make. <laughs> oh, uh, that envelope is the one found on floor here, is it not? Yes. Ah. This letter was found behind the passenger seat of the taxi cab by number eight son, Peter. Observe. Managing director, Lennox Investment Trust, London SW1. Dear sir, it has come to my attention that a Mr. Noel Adamson has been in correspondence with Sir John Glenville, president of the Lennox Trust. However, well, it isn't finished and it's not signed. No. It was typed on this machine. What about this? Merely an old page of a manuscript hastily inserted. It does not even line up with the keys. Adamson grabs the letter from the typewriter, but he doesn't notice that the envelope's been typed first and fallen to the floor. Then he takes this page and puts it in the roller. Why? So police will not look for anything missing. Lovell was heard typing just before he died, remember? In addition, observe, observe. From Paris, Le Monde. From Germany and Italy, the Spiegel, L'Espresso. From New York, the Times. At five o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by the fifth branch of this journalistic tree knocking on my cerebrum. Where is England? It knocked. I immediately placed a call to the Tokyo bookstore, whose rubber stamp appears on the top of each of these journals. They informed me that during the time yacht was in Tokyo Harbor, they had in stock weekly Manchester Guardian. Vancouver to New York, or... New York, London, wherever you prefer. The destination is unimportant. Oh, just one moment. Mr. Hadrachi's son has requested me to inform you there will be a flight leaving the moment Inspector McKenzie releases us. You will be on that flight. I make my own arrangements, Lambert. Mr. Hadrachi's son considers Adamson little more than a prostitute. And you, Mr. Kidder, a procurer for having invited him. Mr. Lovell's sleeves are pulled down past his knuckles, as they might be if caught under him when dragged from door to here. Uh, tell me, Inspector, the paperweight always kept here? According to the maid. So, Lovell goes to answer door, is struck overhead and killed, then dragged in to here and struck overhead again, this time with paperweight. This time. What else is there to be struck with? Inspector. No fingerprints, but there's traces of blood. Ah. Indeed, Inspector McKenzie. Happiness is a warm clue. Ah. It is wisely written, even a hair casts a shadow. Inspector. I found this in Adamson's closet, crumpled on the floor. Blood? Burgundy. Chambol Moussigny Les Amoureuses, 1962. An extraordinary bottle. You remember it, Peter. I, I first noticed a spot on shirt last night at about 9.30, I believe. What about the hair? Oh. Placed last night over lower drawer file cabinet as primitive but very effective burglar alarm. But then you open drawer, Inspector. No. Someone has. Look. A day without wine? 
is like a meal without sunshine. Old Italian proverb. <laughs> <sighs> when did we start that, Howard? Palermo, about a hundred years ago. Ah, uh, margarita, please. Alex did it to you again, didn't he? Just a little slap here and there. Your conventional reminder of men's superiority. Bartender, give me some ice, please. Bucket full. His passport was forged, fingerprints thus far untraced. He could be of any nationality. The question still remains to be answered. Who shot at Hodrachi? Elementary. Three years ago, a minor office holder was killed when someone took a shot at the Premier of our province. They searched for enemies of the Premier for months, until the mistress of the office holder admitted her guilt. So that shot wasn't meant for the Premier at all. Everybody just assumed that it was meant for him. Exactly. In our case, we assumed that Adrachi was the intended victim of that first attempt, when, in fact, it was Mr. Lovell, stalked by Adamson. As I said, elementary. Mr. Chan, no, you are not just impossible. You are not just obstinate. You are a fool. Adamson is guilty. The case is solved. And not without your help, Mr. Chan. On the 17th, nine days ago, Mr. Adamson read a letter in front of at least half a dozen witnesses. Allegedly from Sir John Glenville, that letter offered 600 pounds a hectare for land on Malta. Which I then agreed to buy from Adamson at 800. Glenville had been dead for a week. He did not write that letter. Obviously, Adamson did, before he left England to get my price up. Lovell saw the obituary, was making inquiries, perhaps intending to blackmail Adamson. There is still the matter of the shirt. If I hear one more word about that accursed shirt, and the he wanted nozzle. Lovell dead. He did not want to be revealed. First, he tried to shoot him. Then he beat him with a fire nozzle. He bludgeoned him with a paperweight. It makes no difference. A man who is fleeing from a murdered... Ah. Inspector McKenzie, when can we go? There will be an inquest tomorrow. There's several possible charges. A man who is fleeing from a murder does not stop to change a shirt which has suffered a small stain of wine. Why does he change it, Mr. Chan? Because he is vain and because he is planning to run off with a woman he feels he must constantly impress in every way. Lovell is killed. Adamson runs off at the same moment, and you dismiss that as sheer coincidence? Suppose the killer is someone else who knows Adamson is planning to flee. Suddenly we are presented with a host of new hypotheses. For example, let me suggest that you, Mr. Hadrachi, have discovered that uh, Adamson and Mrs. Hadrachi are having and please forgive this uncharacteristic oriental bluntness, having an affair. Your life is littered with the shattered careers of men who have foolishly attempted to trifle with you in the past. Adamson must go. But it will not do to have uh, Lambert, let us say, merely dispose of him. In order to cut short both scandal and the possibility of future investigation, a patsy must be found. Lovell. A guest of no particular significance, except that he is an unwanted suitor of your daughter's. Suppose that it is you who arranged to have the letter sent to Adamson. Suppose it is you who furnished the documents which make it appear that Lovell has caught on. Suppose it is you who has a man plant the letter in the taxi cab. And suppose it is you who hire no less a detective than Charlie Chan to make certain that all these incriminating pieces click neatly into place. You have proof of these allegations, Mr. Chen? Not allegations, Inspector. Merely one example of all the possibilities which must be thoroughly explored. I have never turned my back on a man I thought might be innocent. And at that inquest tomorrow, even if as a private citizen, I must be... Must do what, Mr. Chan? Prove yourself a naive fool? Where have you been for 10 years? In a Buddhist retreat? 
Do you really think that I would risk my life, my family, my reputation, like Paris plunging his nation into war over Helen of Troy, to kill a man and arrange to have another blamed because of an infidelity of my wife, which only you, only you, Mr. Chan, find shocking? Infidelity, Mr. Hadrashi, is one of the most common motives for murder. But I, Mr. Chan, I am not one of the most common men. Lambert, where is Mrs. Adachi? baby across on him. Take it easy, you said to him, remember? No more overexertion, and he will last 20 years. I would have walked out on the men, Howard. Really, I would. Why didn't you? Because I'm a woman, Howard. And I have a woman's intuition. And that little message of medical good news just didn't make it for me. Dr. Jameson is telling me a charitable little white lie. That's what I said to myself. Of course, I didn't really expect anything to happen right away, but how much longer does it go on, Howard? I am. I'll, uh... Oh, it is no secret, Howard. Not after all these years. Mr. Chan needs a few more pieces of information to close out his investigation. Would you tell him about the Comte de Ferenzi? The Comte de Ferenzi? What did he do? Nothing at all, my dear. Just tell Mr. Chan about him. And you, in all honesty. Well, he was... He was very beautiful. He had to give that to the Comte di Firenze. But he wasn't really a count at all. And did you have a nice time with him? Yes. And how is he now? He's all right, I guess. Tell Mr. Chan about some of the others. There was Paolo. He's a tenor from Paris. I, I see him sometimes. And... Um, um, Terence. Terence was an Irish playwright. With all must, must up hair. Sebastian Dangerfield, that's what I called him. Oh, Bo. Bo was very good at the backhand. He was a tennis instructor. Uh, did you know about Jimmy and... Please, there is no need to continue this. Mr. Chan thinks that I would kill because of your affairs, Ariane. Oh, Alex makes a little fuss every once in a while out of habit. Like lonely people make love. Kill. You have to really care to kill. Think about doctors. They have a notorious reputation for drinking. It comes from seeing a lot of suffering and having a healthy respect for anesthesia. 
We're also in a constant moral dilemma. We find the truth, but we don't always tell it. was in the Tang Dynasty more than a thousand years ago that our ancestors first classified fingerprints. The thought of failing such a noble tradition of police work is intolerable. Yes, Hong Kong. <laughs> hey, Gim. Go hi, Charlie Chan. Go see on Monday. Yo yak go see ke. Ne hong yak on gin. Okay, yao sao. Go jin hai doim je bot nong. Doje. Doje sai. Kim Lee has tattooed over 10,000 customers. But if he says the man had a Swedish accent. Uh, yes, I would, I would like to place a long distance call, please, to Stockholm, Sweden. Yes. Uh, I want to speak person to person to Inspector Pierre Gunderson. Uh, the number is 45610. Yes, thank you. No. Who searched Lovell's stateroom? Lambert? Irene? You don't know? And what are the others saying tonight? With Adamson safely behind bars? And Mrs. Hadrachi's affair, a matter of common knowledge? Come, children, come! Where are my little pitches with big ears? Let's go. There. See you later, Pop. Ah, Andrew. Oh, come in, please do. I'm sorry I don't even have a cup of tea to offer you. Come in. Not my drink anyway. Any more than these are my people. I'm leaving. <laughs> we authors have strange compulsions. Did you know that Camus said he almost went crazy when he was writing The Stranger? All alone, in one room, for a whole year. I do it six months at a time. A chair, bed, desk, typewriter, a cell. But the other six months, I always managed to get away. <laughs> like an inmate escaping the asylum. Seven years ago, in Paris, I saw this girl selling drawings at the cafes. <laughs> sticking out her tongue at the cops. Flying along the Rue Napoleon in ratty furs and a bright yellow Vespa. Spectacular. So I cashed in on an invitation I had to visit Hadrachi and I took Ariane along, just for laughs. And I keep coming back. <laughs> Trying to get even, I suppose. But you know, all I ever take with me from here is guilt. Guilt. Now, there is a spectacular source of creative energy, Charlie. I wonder sometimes, whatever you suppose I would find to write about, Charlie, if ever I lost my appetite for guilt. You must come visit us. One summer, Andrew. My grandchildren dream many happy plots. Jameson's told me the most terrible thing about Alex. I don't got the hay, I say it. I don't got the blues, no mama. I got the hands crazy. Well, the only man that I bet you are. Really, Mr. Chan, you ask almost as many questions as Mr. Lovell used to.
I'm going to fly to Torino with Giancarlo. Perhaps you will come. We could go to Venice. Why don't you do over the apartment there? Do it in yellow. Lemon yellow sheet satin. Remember? The apartment in Paris? Seven years ago. You said the color was sensual. I said... I thought it was different. No. No, you distinctly said it was sensual. Inspector Gunderson. Yeah, Inspector. Uh, your girl, Charlie Shan, Ivan Coover. catch up with. When in hot pursuit of critical information, that is most possible. Now, what have you learned? Well, here's one for you. Lovell's been pumping everyone on the yacht for information about the Hadrachis. And he was always snapping pictures when he thought no one was looking, according to Giancarlo. Uh -huh. And he typed every night for at least two or three hours. Certainly not for his employer. Kidder wasn't working on anything. You know what I think, Pop? Mr. Lovell was writing a book himself. Now, let us think. For wisdom, like molasses, though sweet, is very slow to pour. Mr. Lovell, the quiet one, writing a book. Murdered. All suspicion focuses on the flamboyant Mr. Adamson, when in truth he is the least important character of them all. More and more, everything seems to connect with Mr. Johansson. Who is Johansson? Oh, you remember him. You saw him at the airport. There was that moment of recognition. Lambert shouted something. Johansson. Johansson must have feared what I might discover aboard that ship. That is why the attempt on my life. Inspector Gunderson told me that Gunnar Johansson had been a very successful policeman in Stockholm, Sweden. Yet in August 1963, he suddenly resigned his commission and disappeared completely. Why? What happened in August 1963? I am not certain yet. But by coincidence, Mr. Hadrachi's prior yacht was anchored in the harbor at Stockholm, Sweden, that same month. One of her seamen was treated at the neurological clinic at St. Olaf's and then returned to the ship. Yet his medical records at St. Olaf's disappeared. The same as Gunnar Johansson's. I suspect that Dr. Jameson's records might prove to be a mine of information. Doreen, go down to the telegraph office and find out whether on the day the yacht docked here in Vancouver, someone answering Mr. Lovell's description didn't send a cable to San Francisco. Now? Yes, now. Unless at this time tomorrow, you want Mr. Lovell's murderer to be a hundred miles at sea. Now go, go. You, come. Scotch and soda, double. I'm sorry, Mr. Kidder, we are closed. 
It's a five dollar drink. Get it. Give us all in death? Chloral hydrate. Downers. All the way. Vaccinations, prescriptions, surgery. Lindquist Gunnar employed August 1963. A familiar date. And he was operated on for glaucoma. A familiar ailment. Cecil Calvert, your professor. Jameson said he never heard of him before. There are no books on heart ailments. I think, Peter, it is time you found Inspector McKenzie.
cable. Where do I go to send a cable? Uh, ask for CP communications on the house phone. <laughs> Kenzie, tucked in bed hours ago. Well, wake him. Dear Charlie, forgive me. Murder snarls, doesn't it? It's like string. You just want a little piece and find it's full of knots. I don't want you, Charlie. But you know I killed Jameis. I didn't want Jameis. But he would have known I killed Hadrachi. Hadrachi is dead? Not yet. But I'll get him long before his heart does. What happened, Andrew? There are prizes worth any risk. Especially at my age. I'm sorry, Charlie. Truly, I am. Well, at least it's all over. Regrettably. Far from over. It has been uh, ten years since I last spoke to gatherings such as this. I do so this morning with Inspector McKenzie's kind encouragement to uncover the truth. An encouragement and enthusiasm, I might add, which I did not encounter from you, Mr. Hadrachi, when I first arrived to undertake this case. You failed to impress me yet, Mr. Chan. Indeed, that is most unfortunate, for you have impressed me. Miss Hadrachi, who, beside Mr. Adamson, would you say would want to see Mr. Love dead. I... I don't know. The Hatrachi family of Greece. The Tui family of Italy. It would have been an historic murder, would it not? Except for Mr. Love. Mr. Hadrachi has long since dissuaded me from such an aspiration. As he also attempted to dissuade the now deceased Mr. Love. In this, as in so many other matters, you are truly an enigma. Why this paranoid obsession with security? Why your pills under lock and key? Why the zealous protection of your daughter? Have you no idea what it is he fears, Mrs. Hadrachi? Since 1963? Since just shortly before you two were married? No. Didn't Dr. Jameson tell you before he was murdered by an overdose of chloral hydrate? A powerful painkiller and sedative stocked in copious quantity in his medicine cabinet. Not that too, killer. Damn you! How long did it take, Andrew? Five minutes? Ten? Did you tell him how, just when you believed her hopelessly lost to you, Ariane came to you and promised you undying gratitude in exchange for killing her husband? You agonize us with your theories and innuendos. What am I to believe? End this Chan, quickly! One does not quickly paint a portrait of so bizarre and mysterious a family as yours, Mr. Hadrachi, if I may continue. Let us first explore the theory to be presented later today at the inquest that Adamson murdered Lovell. 
You received a letter from London. Which I did not send. A letter which Lovell purportedly detected as a fraud when he realized that Sir John Glenville was already dead. Tell me, Andrew, uh, how did you happen to engage Mr. Lovell? My former secretary left me for a better paying job. Lovell happened along at precisely the right moment. But did he just happen along? Perhaps it is for the purpose of blackmail that Mr. Lovell has so determinedly gained access to this yacht. He is on to something. He is seated in his room, writing to England for more evidence when there is a knock on his door. Yes? He rises and inadvertently brushes to the floor the envelope already addressed. Mr. Lovell, for all we know, has called Adamson to his room to taunt him with this knowledge. He shows him the incriminating article that he has spotted in the Manchester Guardian and the letter that he is writing. Adamson, virtually without funds, is desperate to swing his land deal with Mr. Hadrachi. He dare not be revealed. He pleads for time, but Lovell is unmoved. Adamson thinks fast. He puts a piece of manuscript in the typewriter should Lovell have been heard typing. Concealing his motive by taking with him both the letter and the newspaper, he flees, masking that flight as a last-minute lark with Mrs. Hadrachi. The newspaper is possibly tossed into the ocean. The letter, temporarily forgotten, is stuffed into the back seat of the taxi cab. But was it really Mr. Adamson who put the letter there? Are there not others who needed to see Mr. Lovell out of the way? Let us assume that one of them wishes him dead and Mr. Adamson to be framed for it. It is then arranged for the letter to be sent to Mr. Adamson from England as part of a carefully invented motive. In the version I believe to be accurate, Mr. Lovell is typing something quite different from the letter Peter discovered in the taxi cab. He removes the paper so that its contents will not be noticed by whoever is at the door. Lovell is murdered with a fire nozzle, which is then replaced intentionally at the same time that Mr. Adamson is changing his shirt and preparing to run off with Mrs. Hadrachi. Lovell is dragged into the room and struck again, this time with a paperweight. To build the case against Adamson, the Manchester Guardian is taken, the envelope prepared by the killer is planted on the floor, and the page of manuscript, whose significance the killer does not realize, is placed in the typewriter. To pique my investigative curiosity. The murderer, however, made one fatal mistake. Mr. Lovell had left the typewriter on stencil, a fact which the killer failed to notice. Why would Mr. Lovell have the typewriter set at stencil? And what was Mr. Lovell afraid could possibly be seen on that page all the way from the door? Peter? Mr. Lovell did not want anyone to see that the paper was inserted in the typewriter backwards. Moreover, two very fascinating books were found in Mr. Lovell's room. Scandalous exposés of very famous families, written by one John Sebastian, uh, Doreen. The day the yacht docked in Vancouver, a man fitting Mr. Lovell's description sent a cable to San Francisco. It was signed, John Sebastian. It went to a Mr. Gordon Johnson. Gordon Johnson. Gunnar Johansson. This wire photo was received by me from Sweden. Yes, Lindqvist. Hired by you in 1963 and released in 1967 because of failing eyesight. Lindqvist. And this? Johnson, Johansson, Lindqvist. One and the same man. The first head of your security force, hired by you in Sweden in 1963. A man so desperately concerned with what I might find aboard your ship that he tried to kill me 
to stop me. What was that thing he so feared I might find out? Laurel Patridge. Not a heart medicine at all. Is it not true that Dr. Jameson told you to stop waiting for your husband to die? That in truth your husband did not have and never had had a heart condition? Father. Gunnar Johansson knew the whole truth. He sold that information to John Sebastian. Mr. Love, information which would have been published in Sebastian's sensational next book on the Hadrachi family. A book he has been working on every night, typed in stencil on the back of this manuscript. Virtually illegible, unless rubbed with charcoal or treated in some similar fashion. On the 16th of September, 1970, the publisher of my two previous books forwarded me a letter from a former Swedish police officer who had at one time been head of security for the renowned Greek tycoon, Mr. Alexander Hadrachi. This man, Gunnar Johansson, had in August 1963 stolen at Mr. Hadrachi's direction from St. Olaf's Hospital in Stockholm medical records of a seaman from Hadrachi's yacht. These records indicated the onslaught of a rare neurological condition. Stop! You are that seaman, Mr. Hadrachi. For the love of God, stop. Mr. Adamson was framed. Mr. Lovell's body was discovered while Adamson was fleeing. You happened by Lovell's stateroom at the very critical moment, Miss Hadrachi. Was that by sheer chance? Mr. Lovell asked me to come. Asked you? He sent me a note. May I ask who it was that delivered that note? If you're ready, I can draft a confession. Saying that you actually killed Lovell or merely assisted in the details? I accept full responsibility. Mr. Hadrachi, you have an employee more loyal and thorough than I believe even you recognize. The rest of these people can go. My sister. I would prefer that she left too. Please, Mr. Chan. Andrew, what will I do now? You get me the best lawyer in the world. The truth, Mr. Chan. The truth would be very dear to me. Truth does not go away because one is absent for a little while. Mr. Chan, you've uh, put me in a most awkward position with my husband. I suggest you will be in an even more awkward position at Inspector McKenzie's interrogation. When did you learn that Lovell was Sebastian? Two days after he arrived. Hmm. And what did you think you would find in this manuscript so damaging that it would warrant sacrificing any human life in order to suppress it? It's all right, Mr. Hadrachi. I believe Paul already knows, unless I am very gravely mistaken. Well, Paul, do you want Mr. Lambert to continue with this loyal and pointless charade?
No. Thank you, Lambert. But it is my father who has need of you now. You've looked through it. True. How does he describe our particular family problem? Is Huntington's chorea suitably sensational for him? What? How about the details? The brain cells, atrophied, gradually destroyed. The body less and less in control of itself. Trembling, shuffling. Eventually not moving at all, paralyzed, brain twisted by delusions, paranoia, and eventual dementia after 15 or 20 years. Little is left of the animal, nothing of the man. It's incurable, inevitable. It strikes each generation at a younger age. I've known for some time what a man my father really is. The lengths that he, he's gone to to protect us <laughs> in ways which... Irene and I often found hard to appreciate. Discouragement against getting married and having children. A relief when Ariane failed to give him yet another foredoomed heir. I did not know, Paul. Not when you were born, not until after. Irene has at least 12 more years before the first symptoms appear. 12 years, if not of bliss, at least of some innocence. No. I believe she would be very willing to sacrifice whatever innocence you think she has to share in the love I see here before me now. She must be told the truth, you know. In any case, it's information she won't learn screaming from the pages of Lovell's muckraking. When did you learn, Paul? Lambert. Read off your answer a number of times from his own pocket. Finally, the man came to me. I would have killed you, Anson, if you chewed his face once more. A thing I believe he sensed, which was why he sold the information to Lovell. I'd gladly change my job at this moment for that of the car washer once mentioned. I, I have been working out the confession in my mind, Inspector. Deprives the public of any morbid fascination. In watching the day-to-day -day demise of an otherwise fortunate and proud family, if you'd be so generous. Here's the luggage, Pop. Yeah, thank you. Now, let's see. Tina, one Indian papoose doll. And Jan, one wind-up Royal Canadian Mountie. And for Oliver and Mangling, one hand-carved Wheelbone Eskimo chess set. Oh, yes. Mr. Chan, it's just arrived for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very pleasant journey, Mr. Chan. Thank you, Peter, please. Eh? Wrong news always travels fastest. Your father is not out of retirement. Pop, how could the Cushman diamond just disappear? It's the biggest in the world. I haven't the faintest idea, and I'm not the tiniest bit interested, but give me that. 
It may help while away the time on the plane while I try to decipher why a left-handed lady should write with such obvious taste from Zanzibar on rice paper typical of the East Indies and why she should have... future of the planet hangs in the balance as a giant meteor heads straight for Earth. Everyone's and everything's survival depends upon the actions of one man in the apocalyptic thriller Judgment Day, tonight at 9 on 5. Up next, we've the latest 5 News.